mountains calling out in distress Saying, come on over and fix our loneliness It's been a while, but I know I still belong Where the windows look like paintings Hung up on the wall in those nights Stars and crooked alibis When we finally can take on the world edges of our seat, waiting only for a chance to fly. Somewhere that's not yet at night. We watched as the sun fell low in the sky. I saw angels gasp at the snow-capped peaks Saying, wouldn't it be nice If our gowns were white as these And they are in now Just to get sleep with tomorrow Well, I heard that they're going way out west I'll be ready in the morning I'll pack my things and rewrap my face Okay, I am Jeremy Burns. And I am Matthew Scott Phillips. But you know that. You know that, I hope. (laughs) (laughs) And if you don't, I am Matthew Scott Phillips. And I am Jeremy Burns. (laughs) Shameless self-promotion. Oh, yeah. Repetition? (laughs) Yeah. We are Music Student 101. Who are we? Uh, Music Student 101, the Music Theory Podcast. Yes, and I would even broaden it to say a music education podcast. And yes, it's right there in the name. And we are all music students... Jeremy is, I am, all of you are. And all of you may have noticed that wonderful intro track. That was an original song, A Chance to Fly, by our good friend Scott Jackson. Nice job, Scott. Very nice. Nice job. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. Mm -hmm. But first, we have some cool stuff to share. Yes, we do. This is episode 80. Woohoo! We have made 80 of these. Yes, sir. And uh, from July of 2016, when we first kicked this off. I figured we'd probably get about 15. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I think when I was listening to my How to Make a Podcast podcast, they were saying, um, if you if you make it past seven episodes, you're probably doing okay. <laughs> and it looks like we're doing okay. Yeah. And speaking of doing okay, Matt, what is that on the floor to your left? This looks like some sort of libation. It is a beverage. It is a beverage. Now... It might be a frothy beer. Or yes. It might be a cola beverage. We're not specifying. We're not going to specify. We're just going to have. We're just going to click it open. Do that. Look at that. In in celebration of our 
Oh, why, 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 are, we, why are we drinking this? Uh, episode 80. This, that, and guess what? We have gone over 300,000 downloads, my friend. Woohoo! 300,000. And to me, that's a lot. Now, I know there's like little 14 year olds on TikTok, whatever that is, <laughs> who probably have a million views by now and have been doing it for about three weeks. I don't even know what TikTok is. It's, uh, I, I tell you about it, but it's, oh, we, yeah, it seems like a lengthy <laughs> gif with, with, with audio. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. We, we, uh, we old fogies, we're not, you know, we're not good with the Facebooks and nah, the, the Googles. tweeters and the, you know. But, the, but what we are good at is listening to music. Mm-hmm. So cheers to that and cheers to uh, Mike Cunliffe, our announcer, and Brian Malloy, our drum player, Jerome Chapman, our guitarist, and everyone else that's helped us out. Cheers. I think, before we start... <clears throat> burps, we'll have to edit out a lot of burps here. <laughs> <laughs> I think that before we uh, talk about this opening track, let's just go ahead and get this social deal going here, right? Okay. We're not going to do any new reviews, and we're not going to do any listener mails. Okay. But I do want to keep the Patreon thing going because we keep on getting new Patreon patrons. And and we have to express our appreciation to our Patreons. They, they, they need to feel appreciated because we do appreciate them so much. Indeed. And so uh, in proper fashion, we shall appreciate our friend today. Indeed. Taylor Handleton. Taylor Handleton. Out of Baltimore. Out of ba- good old Baltimore, MD. And Taylor says, I'm an engineer, but I live across from the Peabody Institute, so I'm hoping this osmosis eventually starts working. <laughs> <laughs> I invite you over here, Matt, because I'm hoping osmosis will kind of work when you're sitting <laughs> when you're sitting about 10 feet away from me. <laughs> well. Uh, I first heard from Tat Taylor, uh, Taylor from... Uh, he listened to it, episode 14. We had this episode 14, Being a Performer. Mm, I remember. And we were talking about you know how people dress on stage and how people dress up in nice nice suits for concerts and stuff like that. And I was like, well, people do kind of bluegrass bands, probably just wear you know jeans and right. T-shirts and stuff like that. And he was like, well, have you heard about um, the Punch Brothers or Nickel Creek? This is Chris Thiele, the mandolin player, the, the okay. mandolin genius, actually. Yeah. But his point was... These guys actually dress up pretty nice. And as I look around at modern bands today doing folk music, I do see they wear fancy hats and suspenders. And yeah, I do actually feel like, you know, it's one of these things I don't know for a fact. I just kind of intuit it. But I do feel like there's a bit of a tradition in folk music of sort of dressing up if you when you wind up at Carnegie Hall or, or something. You <laughs> right. know, out in the holler, you know, they're, they're probably in their jeans and T-shirts, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but there, there I I feel like there may be sort of a tradition of of fancier dress in inappropriate occasions where folk musics like bluegrass are concerned. Yeah. Well, um, there's something else to to a uh, good old Taylor here. Actually, he's a Jethro Tull fan, a fellow Jethro uh-huh. Tull fan. Uh huh. Really complicated music, but done in a rock and roll fashion with a flute. <laughs> with a flute, no less. <laughs> Check out that. He won a Grammy for Best Metal Album once over Metallica. And and oh, yeah. Lars Ulrich was like... What? Kinda, yeah, kind of kind of fake playing mad, but not entirely fake, fake playing <laughs> mad. You know, a little bit real mad, mostly fake mad. But, right, yeah. right. <laughs> Half joking. Half joking, yeah. So we got some good news, like I said, from uh, Taylor... He has started up something cool and was asking me about it, and I thought it was a great idea. We have our Music Student 101 Facebook page, right? Mm-hmm. But he thought it would be a good idea to try something new. Okay. Tell us what he had to say. And so uh, Taylor says, For some reason, Facebook seems to not put page discussions in people's news feeds very often. So I think a group would be a better way to get discussions going. Mm-hmm. I think you can link to a group from a page so it'd be a one-stop uh, shop. Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe one and a half. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was imagining mostly listeners talking to each other, but it'd be awesome if you could hop in from time to time. Well, that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a member of a number of Facebook uh, groups, everything from uh, proper notation procedures to composers uh, plugging their new works and performances to you know pages about video games and... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, I, I think I've maybe even have created a group before. So, so yeah, uh, that's that's something we can look into. 
Well, Taylor has invited me as an admin, and I gladly accept it because I think it's a great idea for you guys to get the chance to talk to each other. Yes, and we will put we will put a link on our Facebook page. Absolutely. To our Facebook group. Mm-hmm. So just head on over to uh, the Music Student 101 Facebook page or group. You could probably just search in Facebook. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so uh, there you have it. So Taylor Handleton, thank you for your patronage. Indeed. And thank you for your enthusiasm in helping us get this uh, spread the word, get more people into it. You know, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, it's brilliant. And uh, you might notice something new and different on the Patreon site. I have found. Well, we had a listener write in. We'll talk about her in a, f- in a future episode. But a friend of ours, Maddie Stern, who's actually doing graphic design, but very much into music. Mm. She sent us a, a, a logo that fits so much nicer into the Patreon circle. <laughs> oh, my! I do thumbnails, right? I got a thumbnail. And everyone's got these circle frames you got to fit everything into <laughs> right. now. So that everything doesn't quite fit, but she sent me this really classy, nice thing. And if it's not up by the time this episode comes out, it soon will be. <laughs> That's awesome. So we want to thank Maddie. Stern. We really appreciate it whenever our listeners help us out with with technology, because you know mm-hmm. we are not graphic designers, no, yeah. <laughs> you know, or economists, no, or physicists, no, or, or pianists, or piano players. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> But we are music student 101. But we are music students. <laughs> yes, yes, we are music students. Now, um, quick little PSA, a little public service announcement. Guys, for this episode, you should consider wearing headphones. Decent ones. I mean, yeah, if you got some really good earbuds, yes, yes. But if you got some serious headphones, you know, cover up your whole ear and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Try and do that because there's a lot of really great subtleties in this music that you are going to miss if you just got your phone sitting on the counter or yeah. at the table. Or if you're, you know, mowing your lawn while you listen, like, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like some of our listeners do. Yeah, right? myself included. <laughs> but um, anyways, that all goes without saying. Right. You know what I mean? Yep. I mean, but still, I got to say it. Uh, and there's also some cool stereo things you're going to hear that you're going to want headphones for. Yeah. Uh, now we're going to play a game. Yay. This whole episode, we're going to play the music. Okay, we're going to just... Introduce the composer and just play the music, not say much about it at all. Right. While this is going on, you guys listen and see if you can try and think about what the composer is trying to say. Yeah. Or what emotions they were going through. Absolutely. Or what they were thinking when they wrote these pieces. Yes. And and I have to say before we before we get into this, this is this music that we got for our listener compositions has I am legitimately impressed. Yeah. Guys, I am legit, and I, I'm not just saying that just to be nice. Uh, Jeremy knows that I'm not really half as nice in, in person <laughs> as as I am in the podcast. I have to temper you down for the show sometimes, <laughs> don't I? <laughs> but uh, but no, I am I'm legitimately impressed. There's some very very good music here, and uh, you guys all deserve our kudos. Yes, yes. So, um, and then I guess afterwards we'll we'll actually give you the story, the backstory. Yes, and then yeah, we'll and then how. we'll we'll uh, listen, and then we'll talk about it. We'll give some 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 uh, some context. And while our good doctor has heard this music, he has our good doctor <laughs> does not know the backstories. I do not know backstories. So yeah, I, I just have music. I have some scores in front of me for some of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have listened to all of them, mm-hmm. and uh, but that's all I have. All right, so let's get into it, huh? Yes. We have already heard, and again, oh, one more thing. You didn't hear our announcer, Mike Cunliffe, or any of our original music because we wanted to, uh, we didn't want to have voices going on over songs. Yeah. The whole cocktail party effect thing. You know, it's like, right. It doesn't make any sense for us to be talking or having anything going on while someone is singing words. You need to be hearing the words, the melodies, the music. That is why we came in with Scott Jackson's A Chance to Fly from his album, A Chance to Fly. Right. Unadulterated. Unadulterated. And let's talk about it. Okay. Scott was living in Connecticut at the time, Mm -hmm. but he had Denver on the mind. Ah. He said he went ahead and recorded this album. He had been writing this through through high school and through college. Mm Mm-hmm. And listening to a lot of the lyrics, I'm pretty impressed that anyone in high school would have come up with that kind of... I mean, it's really poetic. A lot of it's very introspective. I'm talking Uh about the whole album, okay? Right. Um... So he decided to go ahead and record this album a little bit later on and uh, just put it out there. And he, right. got, he got a lot of really good feedback from this song, mm. A Chance to Fly, and that kind of inspired him to get back into music. That's wonderful. He's also an engineer. A lot of our, a lot of our fans and listeners are engineers. Mm. And 
I, I just have to assume it's because they like to break down and analyze things, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But it sounds like that's just a means to an end, which is right. being able to build his own recording studio sure, yeah. and make good sounds. Yeah, absolutely. And this was all done in his home recording studio. It's, it's beautiful. And this is all Scott. Yeah. This is all his music. This is him playing, you know, all the instruments and everything. So. Very, very good job. We got to be impressed. Yeah, yeah. So, uh... Check him out. We have a uh, link with more information on the website. We have a link on the website. Where you can find his music. That's sjacksonmusic.com. Uh-huh. And uh, I would highly recommend you go back and listen to this song. You know, he's got some of my favorite lyrics uh, in this song. Is actually, he says, uh, he's talking about looking at Colorado and just seeing how beautiful it is. He right, says, yeah. uh, I saw angels gasp at the snow-capped peaks, saying, wouldn't it be nice if our gowns were white as these? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, that's some that's some fascinating imagery. Yeah, so listen for that kind of stuff, and listen yeah. for the uh, five of five in the end of the chorus. Right. Yeah. There's a little. Fi- he he kind of challenged us to to find the five of five, yeah. and I think I found it. I th- I think it's right towards the end of the chorus, going into like the last line of lyric in the chorus. Kind of like the turnaround. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like the turnaround. Uh, write in and tell me if I'm right, Scott. But so pause. Rewind, listen again. Yes. We'll catch up in a second. Absolutely. Okay, we're back. All right. <laughs> in case you actually did that. In case you actually did that. It's only been a couple of seconds we've been sitting here. <laughs> um, no, we hope you did that. We actually, we, we hope you gave it another listen. So I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and listen to our first piece here, other okay. than our intro music from Scott Jackson. Right. <laughs> um, and we're not going to say much about it other than it is written by our friend Cody M. Gibson. Okay. Cody M. Gibson from League City, Texas. All right. Let's, this let's is, do it. This is called This Would Make You Proud.
So there we go. Be, very haunting. Yeah, very haunting. Uh, very, uh, very. What's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, atmospheric. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, sort of meditative. Meditative. We were we were listening to this a while a little while ago, and I said, "This does this sound like a minimalist piece to you?" Uh huh. And then we were having a discussion on whether there's sections or if it's through composed, right? Right. Yeah. Um, it was an interesting discussion we had. Uh, so is this piece minimalist? Well. Minimalism in the original academic sense meant a a minimum of musical material uh, played uh, in in heavy repetition for a, an effect of transcendence mm -hmm. or meditation you know, or or a trance like effect. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's evolved. That was in the 60s. You know, there was, so there was minimalism, and then there was post-minimalism, and then there was post-post-minimalism uh, and, and, you know, things. Um, so in this day and age, a lot of things can be called minimalism. Whether, whether it's appropriate or not is, is sort of a matter of opinion. Mm -hmm. I feel like this has minimalistic elements, not only because it uses... Similar musical material throughout, right? So the little piano arpeggiation, yeah, yeah, is is consistent throughout most of the music, but but also um, because of its affect, you know, this transcendent uh, uh, affect. You know, it's taking you away out of. You know, it's, it's not meant to be communicative in a in a talking to you prose like. Way right, it, it's sort of meant to take you sort of out of your element, almost you know? in a zone like meditative trance, like right, yeah, yeah, and and for that reason, I think it has some spiritual kinship to the to the minimalist movement too. Um, yeah, um, Jeremy was uh, inclined to con to sort of break this down into an A section, which is that sustained. Uh, piano arpeggio over a, over a sustained pedal note in in the bass, mm -hmm. and then a B section which includes uh, the six chord, right. and then sort of goes through a sounds like it might be a circle of fifths progression, but then sort of goes through a, a chord progression back to the um, to me, and, and and then and then the A section comes back to me. I was thinking maybe the most descriptive thing was to sort of consider it cyclical. Mm -hmm. So you, you think of you think of this. Uh, phase of the a you know, or of the um, the piano arpeggio and this uh, you know it kind of goes around you know and 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 takes you away from where you are and and then when it it, it hits this uh, six chord it goes through these chords that sort of take you back to a so it kind of bounces you back to where you started mm -hmm. and then it goes around again the second time faster you know we get to that a little bit faster the right? sixth chord yeah yeah and then the third time maybe we get to we, we we're adding some instruments and adding some some uh, other uh, musical ideas yeah so you, you, it sounds to me almost sort of uh, cyclical you know uh, more than an a section and then a B section that is entirely different and then an a section again or something like that cyclical compared to the through composed or a kind of a little bit of both. Uh, well, you know, through composed, again, this is all highly subjective. You know, mm -hmm. everybody has their their opinions and their notions of these things. Through composed, to me, uh, the term the term implies a lack of any kind of return from original material. Right. Really, okay. You know? Okay. Or or a lack of. Um, no, uh, a, a a lack of going, getting back to the same place you were, or continuity, or yeah, yeah, uh, uh, something like that. Through composed means we just wrote one bar after the next until we were done. Ah, nah, that's you not know? this. Yeah, maybe this is not this so much. I mean, you could make an argument. First of all, that I'm wrong about through composed. I mean, look at you know Schubert's Earl Koenig and whatever, and there's continuous elements. And uh, and second of all, that the, the, this is. Doing that, but but to to me, uh, I, I think this is more cyclically composed, and I, and I'm I'm making up terminology now. But <laughs> well, as as we go, he still he keeps on adding new cool elements like you were talking about. Yeah. Um, the drums, for example, very subtle and kind of teasing all the way through. Yeah. yeah. And then it doesn't really pick up till the end. Now Cody is he says that these are MIDI drums mm -hmm. samples, 
but I feel like he's playing them like a cool drum player would play them. You right, know what I mean? Yeah. Even though he's probably just hitting a drum pad or the keys on his yeah, keyboard. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll listen for that. Also, towards the end, you'll start to notice these kind of cool syncopations that pop in in the bass and the drums. Yeah, also something that that, that has... Um that, that endears it to a minimalist perspective too. This this grad, you know, this occasional addition of a new element. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you just put it on loop and sit there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which yeah. is not at all what's going on either. So before we go ahead and play Cody's piece one more time, I do want to give you a little backstory. Okay. So Cody wrote in saying, seven years ago, my best friend died. I had known him since the seventh grade, and he is the one that introduced me to Cakewalk." Huh. Yeah, an old school doll from 1997. Yeah, we remember Cakewalk. We do, in which MIDI could be written on the staff and printed out, etc., etc. He is also the one that taught me the very basics of music theory and song structure when we were 17, 18 years old. And uh, going in <laughs> angstly to college. <laughs> That's how you go into college, angstly. Yeah. Um, he and I would always trade music back and forth to show that we were currently writing, to show what we were currently writing. It was a musical conversation using a language that nobody this day seems to understand, hmm. except you guys and all my <laughs> bros and sisters at Music Student 101 <laughs> listener crowd, of course. Isn't that great? Yeah. Sadly, he passed away in 2012 due to spontaneous heart failure. He was 27 years old. Oh, that's tragic. That's way too young. Yeah. Um... His untimely demise coincided with yet another one of my attempts at college, this time as a music student. This also broke the dam of an already volatile relationship I had with alcohol, which continued um, into severe addiction to alcohol and untimely homelessness about five years later. Oh, man. No kidding. Um, Okay, so moving on. uh, Working through personal demons, and I mean really, really working, when you're forced to literally survive like an animal is an enlightening experience. Hmm. Uh, there are lots of details, but suffice it to say, I am now 2.5 years sober. Oh, congratulations. Congratulations, indeed. Back in school and taking it seriously and getting the best grades I've ever had in my life. Yeah, Cody. Yeah, Cody. Employed as a research assistant, doing work I have always loved that closely mirrors music and writing the best music I ever have. Hence the title of this track, I Think You'd Be Proud, is of course addressed to him. To his friend, to yeah. To his friend. That's beautiful. That is beautiful, and I think his friend would be proud. I do, too. So with all that in mind, yes. one more time. One more time. This Would Make You Proud by Cody M. Gibson. This is what I would have called the A section, right? Right. You got piano. This is very minimalist. Strings? Light strings? Not yet. Am I just hearing reverb from the piano, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, you're hearing reverb from the high piano note. Enter the drums. It's a good sound. It's a good fat patch. Yeah. It's kind of that 80s gated reverb sound going on in the drums. Yeah, but I like how he's... He's he's not in a hurry to add textures. Yeah. You know? That comes the that sounds like a bass. Low, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, like everything's at least eight measures before a new texture texture comes in. I like how he's not in a hurry. Mm-hmm. It gives you a chance to sort of live with what's there before something new is introduced. Right? Yeah. Now what what uh, I still consider this part of the same section. Just mm-hmm, sure, yeah. We've had this cool new higher part. Uh huh. It's a counter melody. Yeah, yeah. A little hi hat. He's just steady, but does something kind of cool every now and again. Yeah, yeah. right there. Yeah. <laughs> that I was talking over. Okay. This is our chord progression. What I would have considered the B section, right? This yeah. is an A minor chord? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. Bye. <laughs> so there's a 
cadence. Yeah. And now we're kind of back at the beginning of the circle with just the piano, right? Mm -hmm. That low, that low yeah. hand, left hand. Yeah. And now maybe the second time we kind of go through this fat. We don't have to spend so much time the second time around because we have heard it, right? We've uh, we've been introduced to most of the elements, right? Yeah. So now we're at six way quicker. Yeah. like it did last time. Yeah. And then just a one, huh? Yeah, skipped the five. We had uh, eight measures of four instead of uh, four measures of four and four measures of five. Mm -hmm. Now I think... This is the A minor again. Yeah, yeah. So... See what it does this time. We got the four again, right? Yep. Hold it. Yeah. Hold it steady. And then. Yeah. Uh, we only got that five that one time. Yeah, yeah. Was that a plagal cadence? Would you call that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Four to one. Okay. section. Yeah? Oh, wow. Uh, what about that A minor earlier? Was that just all part of the A section? I mean, you know, it depends on how you want to perceive. Cyclical. Yeah. <laughs> Cyclical. Now, dig this. Syncopations in the bass? Yeah. those drones that have been holding out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool beat, huh? Yeah. Oh, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Some new synth kind of vocal like voice elements. Yeah. The producers of Stranger Things really need to hire this guy. I know, right? They're missing out. Varied a lot. Yeah. And then retardando. Yeah. At the end. Yeah. So that uh, piano arpeggiation that had anchored the whole thing had, has been there the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. I love how um again like he held out on those drums all the way through and then we finally got what we wanted at the very end. You know. Yeah. Some, yeah. <laughs> some really cool fills too. So to program those things and still make it sound you know like a like a good very drum human. Player. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. All right, so. Well done. Good job, Cody. Uh, yeah. Thanks again, man. And let's move on to the next one, shall we? Okay. Okay, so moving on, we have our friend Alex O'Hagan. Mm-hmm. Alex is a self-taught pianist and guitar player from the Detroit area. Welcome, Alex. Welcome to our little uh, jam session. Yeah. Uh, your position is well-deserved in this jam session, Alex. Um, this is a piece called Mossy Oak. Oh, yeah. I, I remember this one very well. I want to say this is C Dorian because it looks like um, there, there's a sharp six in there, but it looks like the key is in C. Uh, I'm sorry. It looks like C minor. 
Um, so I want to say it's in C Dorian. Uh, yeah, I, I'm looking at this very big score printed out on eleven uh, or an eight and a half by twelve. So I'm I need my specs. This but. is a very involved piece, a very big score actually. A huge. And to my knowledge, all this is Alex's work. Um, mm, and, and I want to know what Alex's uh, sounds are. Yeah, yeah. That, that sounds like that might be East West or something. Yeah. Uh, so if Alex, if you're so inclined to share with me the the. VST uh, stuff that software that you used for this uh, <laughs> inquiring minds want to know. You know, actually, it, it looks like um, going back on his notes, I found where he mentioned East West. He did. Oh yeah, he did mention that. So not only are you f so f familiar with uh, different scoring, like <laughs> Sibelius, you know Sibelius, you know. You're telling me I'm I'm learning that you can tell probably a Garretton orchestra from an East West orchestra. This is a dubious skill <laughs> to be sure, but yeah. I'm impressed. <laughs> so let's hear what we're talking about, shall we? Yes. This is Mossy Oak by Alex O'Hagan. Okay. All right. You know, uh, wow. <laughs> to, to me, it sounded like the intro to like a Pixar movie or something like that. I, I was know. thinking Danny Elfman. I think, oh, Danny Elfman. Very yeah. good. Very good. Thinking Danny Elfman with, with the uh, with all the kind of chimey percussion and things. I don't know. You know, some composers love it when you compare them to to other people, and some composers hate it. So true you know. that. Yeah. So uh, my apologies if if. Uh, Alex is one of the latter. But I, I think Danny Elfman would be happy to be compared to Alex O'Hagan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he should be. Um, a lot of stuff going on here. Mm -hmm. uh, his orchestration is very good. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, Alex definitely seems to have a pretty, uh, pretty competent grasp of how instruments in an orchestra are used. Yes. Uh, you'll notice that at any given point, there's really only, despite there being a whole army of instruments on this, you know, the, um, there's really only two or three musical ideas going on at one time. Mm -hmm. And the idea is using the different instruments to play the different ideas and mixing them together. You know, it starts with piano and vib vibraphone playing the same melody, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So this is sort of 
uh, an orchestrator sort of mixes these two colors, piano and vibraphone, like a like a painter with his with his uh, his easel. Right? Oh, speaking of the mix, man, this guy really has a good idea. I mean, like the dynamics and the mix, the way the instruments are mixed, right? Yeah. Because I'm guessing he couldn't afford a full orchestra to do this. I'm guessing. I'm like guessing. Said, I, I hope not. Um, um, if he can, I want to give him my card. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, but but yeah. So so he has he has a good idea of of having only two or three ideas, and then other things that are happened to giving it sort of that orchestral ambiance, like uh, pizzicato strings, right? And um, you know, there are places where the horn can do the can do similar things, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so so and the tubular bells, you know, <laughs> the ideas of giving it that uh, that orchestral space, and in that orchestral space, it's two or three ideas, usually in two or three instruments, sort of, right? And then as 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 the music reaches a climax, we're not reaching a climax merely by getting louder. Mm. We're reaching a climax by adding more instruments. And right. So more of this this. Uh, Continuous thing is is playing, and the climax is the trickiest part, mm-hmm. right? Because they, they they've got to all sort of be in their strongest ranges, and they've got to you know you've got a lot of stuff you're mixing, so you've got to have uh, control over over what's going on. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm legitimately impressed by his uh, orchestrational skills. Let's find out a little bit about the backstory of that, shall we? Okay. Um, Alex composed this while working his way through an online course. For cinematic music. Well, look at that. Uh, www.evenent.com. E-V-E-N-E-N-T.com. Very nice. It's called Cinematic Music from Idea to Finished Recording. Uh Uh-huh. By Arne Anderson. Uh Uh-huh. Hmm. He says, My process for writing this track was also influenced heavily by a four-part SATB writing that I have been learning in my music theory classes last year. Big shout out to Professor Dr. Pollat <laughs> at Schoolcraft College. He's the man. Very nice. Dr. Pollat. <laughs> Getting the shout out. Good job, sir. Also, a shout out to Music Student 101 for teaching me what a Neapolitan chord is. <laughs> I use them all the time now, and there's one in this track as well. Yeah. See if y'all can hear the Neapolitan chord. I think I heard it. I think I did too. Yeah. After we'll you heard we'll it. try to call it when we hear it on the playback, but. Uh... <laughs> He says, even though this track doesn't sound anything like a choral, chorale, it is actually pretty uh, simply based off the four-part harmony with some extra counter melody and tradi- transitional parts that help it develop. Almost the entire piece is written over a pedal note. Mm-hmm, yeah, and that pedal note would be C, I would, if I were to take a guess, right? Hold on. The tonic, I think so. Looking at my score here. We have a score, and you can see, you can see this as well on the website. Yep. It is an involved score. Uh, it, it's, it's large. It's large. See? We yeah. decided, yeah. Tonic. Okay, so anyways. I basically started out with a melody and some really badly voiced accompaniment chords. I don't know about that. <laughs> From there, I would work about I would work out my voice leading slowly and painfully, as one should. <laughs> Once I had it, as I do. Once I had a decent piano sketch that made sense, I would start orchestrating that sketch out into my orchestral template for inspiration. Mm-hmm. I love nerdy fantasy stuff and always have. <laughs> Can't get enough of it. I could write music that sounded like wizards dancing around a tavern all day for the rest of my <laughs> life. <laughs> that, that would be the dream, says he. <laughs> That's great. So with that in mind. Yes. You want to give this one more listen? Let's do that. Okay. So one more time. Mossy Oak by Alex O'Hagan. This one might have an A section. This might just be a sectional kind of thing. Yeah. We got our piano and vibraphone here. Yes. And see how they make a sound that neither one of those two instruments can make by themselves, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Pizzicato strings. Yeah. Sort of give it that orchestral sound, right? It's yeah. where you go from chamber music to orchestra music with things like pizzicato strings. Ah, uh, okay. You know. Widening it up a bit. Yeah. Little harp. Yep. In there. He 
This could be maybe a B section. Yeah. Or even a transitional section. Maybe so. Just so pleasant and meandering, yeah. like the opening credits to a Pixar thing like yeah. that. Uh oh. Back in that A section. With more ornamentation. <laughs> more instrumentation. Now this is the kids are putting a little magic wagon together that's gonna fly through the air. Right. And this is right about the part where they're nearing the cliff. And it flies off the edge of the cliff. The children are flying through the air on the magic wagon. Yeah, it, it, as good as those sounds are, um, it's hard for MIDI to do justice to a real orchestral climax, right? You know, yeah. There's this concerns of polyphony and all that stuff. And, mm -hmm. But uh, but very nice job. Yeah. Uh, very nice. Uh, very well orchestrated. I'm legitimately impressed Absolutely. With, the, with the level of orchestration going on there. And I'm sure your professors are very proud of you. Uh, they should be. They should be, yeah. No kidding, man. So uh, great job on that, Alex. That's really, really deep. I mean, a lot of... Lot of I can tell these people really care. Yeah. I can mm -hmm. tell these people that are writing in here are putting together some really well thought out music. Oh, yeah. None of this stuff is is, is just throwing it together. All of this stuff represents uh, some uh, a, a high level of, of musical thought and, and uh, you know, f sort of functioning on a high compositional level to me. Mm. Yeah. And sometimes people like to nerd out on gear. Alex shared with us, he says he's running Logic X on M-Audio BX5 monitors with oxygen MIDI controller. Nice, okay. Um, Motu, Spree, audio interfaces. His classical guitar, <laughs> ukulele, and of course that shaker that looks like a banana. <laughs> Absolutely essential, he says. <laughs> so great job, Alex. Good job, Alex. Well keep, done. Keep it up, buddy. Okay, now we have our friend Ray Parker from Alberta, Canada. Mr. Ray Parker. Yeah. This is a piece called Why Today? Why today? We're stripping it down a bit. This is only piano. Actually, this is piano and a little bit of uh, MIDI violin. Okay. So let's just hear it, shall we? Mm-hmm.
right now. The first time I heard this piece, I was like, okay, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, I was trying to kind of yeah. piece together the story in my head. I'm not sure what you guys came up with. It's very prose-like. Very prose-like. Uh, uh, the, the, the melody. You know, and it's a great contrast to a, a, a Cody's piece, which was kind of not prose-like at all, right? It was sort of trans, uh, uh, meditative and trance-like. And this is much more prose-like. The, the, the melody, uh, which is in the right hand and then later in the violin, it's almost like it's speaking a language. It's, it's almost sort of trying to tell you a story. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, this it's, it's a very disjunct melody. Mm-hmm. Uh, disjunct meaning there are many leaps of more than a, a half step away from the note you're on versus steps, right? Yeah. Which are just moving to the adjacent note in the scale or, or chord. So uh, it, it it has a a very um, declarative uh, feel to me, mm-hmm. you know, and it, it's it's a. Uh, uh, I'm hearing a lot of chord progressions in there. Mm-hmm. Seeing a lot of chord progressions on the score. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, let me tell you a little bit about this. Okay. So Ray says, um, I've suffered some tragedies from the age of 14 to 24. I lost a lot of friends to suicide, drugs, and accidents. Never really dealt with those, just kept going. My father died from an illness when I was 23 years old, just as we were beginning to get along after years of not seeing eye to eye. Well, oh. Yeah. Um, again, I didn't really deal with it, just put it on a shelf and kept going. This year, my son was in a bad car accident. And while he was unhurt, the other vehicle was um, a fatality. Ooh. I was on the scene before the person passed away, which he witnessed. I spent the next few months helping him go through the emotions and dealing with it in a healthy way, mm-hmm. as I should have done many times. Mm-hmm. One day, I was sitting thinking about all the times I'd woken up Started a day normally, only for it to suddenly take a sudden sidestep into emotional turmoil. Hmm. Composing this and using the song to work through those memories helped me to deal with some of the underlying survivor guilt issues I had. Wow. Mm-hmm. So, let's talk, let's play this piece again. Yeah, And I, with, with that in mind. With that in mind and with some of the notes he gave me. Yeah. And see what you guys think. So, you got your score, Matt? <laughs> Is that a yes? Go. That is a yes. <laughs> um, so I put the score. I put this notation on the website. Um, any any time a composer is giving me a score, we'll post it on the website. So feel free to read along. And uh, here we go again. This is Ray Parker from Alberta, Canada, with Why Today. It's an E minor. Mm-hmm. This is C minor. Chromatic. Mm-hmm. So nothing jarring or tragic has occurred at this point. We're just kind of making it through the day. So this is just a normal day. Yeah. On my second listening, I'm hearing a lot more sort of melodic motifs that are consistent throughout the melody than we're... Yeah. Than I necessarily heard the first time. So coming up, measure 19. Yeah. Right around here. We're modulating to D minor. This is when something tragic happens. Right. Yeah, and we were in a new key. Yeah, right. The more complex the mood or emotion, the more challenging it seems to convey musically. Hmm. And we are processing? Yeah, at this point, from the rest this point to the rest of the song, processing the situation, processing your emotions. Perhaps trying to work your way towards some semblance of balance. Maybe to where you were earlier in the day, or even before all this. Kind of dealing with it. Nice, uh, nice syncopation between the violin and the piano. And the... <gasps> What's that? <laughs> 
Sounds like we have a return from the main theme, only in a lower voice, or something similar. Ray says he wasn't sure if he wanted to keep this pulsing violin sound that you're hearing. Mm-hmm. Um, which makes you wonder if really the piece was, was fully finished, you know. Our piece is ever fi- fully finished. I don't think so. I, don't know. Uh, I think Stravinsky said uh, composition is never finished, only abandoned. <laughs> Yeah. Your eyes lit up on that very last chord, didn't they? <laughs> you liked that, didn't you? Uh, it's it's interesting. Um, it, it's, uh, it still feels very prose-like to me. Uh, like I said, on, on second listen, and really this is more like my fourth listen mm-hmm. at this point, mm-hmm. um, I'm starting to see more melodic connections come out in, in that melody, and it's, it's interesting to look at... Um, what uh, the composer is... Um, saying is the sort of the 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 connot- connotation or or the you know we've we've talked about this on on a Patreon episode once about um, the the sort of allegorical level this means that mm-hmm. of representation of something by music and so when he says all right well this is the tragedy this is the something uh, that happens yeah yeah and um, musical ideas are being are representing actual events. Yeah, right? and but uh, these are these are these are uh, uh, r- rhythmic ideas that we've heard before. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they kind of continue to 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 be that way to to be still things we've heard before. Mm-hmm. You know, which um, is, is, is this it's almost like this hidden kind of you know. Well, this is this is a sudden tragedy, but it, it's not our first tragedy, right? right. There's this, there's a sort of this latent um, kind of working through tragedy that, that was there before this particular tragedy, mm-hmm. and now we're just trying to process. Yeah, right? because the first part of this piece is like the, supposedly <clears throat> he says it's just another day, just everyday life. You yeah, know? but still within that, it's not like everything's sunny or it's, it's there's, there's yeah, a lot it's of, not like everything's sunny and happy and yeah, it's kind of disjunctive. Yeah, a little and bit. then you sort of get into the the secondary level, the emotional expressive level, right? Mm-hmm. What is the emotional Mood that we're trying to get at here, mm-hmm. and this emotional mood is is you know very close to you know someone who is sort of in shock, mm, right? Know, not right. just after the tragedy, but but before the tragedy too, which mm-hmm. you know, which is a is a is a is a prescient uh, sort of uh, thing that, that we're dealing with in this music, whether whether he meant that or not, you know, mm-hmm. it is. Uh, it, it, it feels that way, you know, and then and then there's that that sort of third level that's the hardest to describe. That you know the 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 making significant of the experience, mm. right? Um, that is this this sort of the narration of of grief and then tragedy and then process and then to some extent resolution, maybe in the final chord. Because it seems like some of the material from his normal life carries on throughout the piece, but it is yeah. encountered by all these counter melodies. Yeah. And tense moments, and then it gets a little bit normal, and then all of a sudden we get this stab, like in the two minute mark. Yeah, there's this A flat and as a B flat and A cor- A notes together with that and the yeah. fiddle and the, vi- and, the, and the violin. Right, right, yeah. <clears throat> and it's like, who? That is a B flat and an A. Yeah. So let's, hear, let's hear those together real quick. Uh, B flat and A. So this is a major seven. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a little tense chord brings you back into. Yeah. And that's an inversion of a minor second, right? Yeah. You know? Right. So. Uh, Very jarring. Yep, and I, I got to say his uh, his his violin double stops all look playable, mm. which is uh, which is a good thing. You know, you've, you've got to be careful. Not every two note interval on the violin is is necessarily easy. Uh, good point. All, all of Ray's look good. Yeah, all of, all of Ray's look look okay. I'm not seeing any that jump out as huge problems to me right now. So, but it would be a consideration because whenever I'm putting down violin parts, since I don't have a violin, I'm using a keyboard. Yeah, and I might not be thinking about what that would be like to play on a violin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. It's, it's something to consider. Right. You know, little things. You know, like in the score, the violin should probably go above the piano. Fa- fairly easy thing to fix in Sibelius, mm-hmm. or which is what this looks like. The software he he used. I, I've got a quirky little 
uh, thing where I like to guess the, the notation software people are using. It seems like you're spot on most of the time, too. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I've gotten to where I can recognize usually uh, what somebody is using. But, but anyway, um, that's just my neuroses. <laughs> but <laughs> aside, aside from that, uh, yeah, uh, very, very interesting piece. Very fascinating look into, into uh, psychology here. Yeah, listen again and see if you can hear some of those things we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Moving on. Moving on. Okay, now, this is something a bit different here. This is kind of closer to the kind of stuff I find myself doing a lot of. Mm -hmm. Working with the resources I have. Sure. Knowing I'm not great at MIDI articulations and making <laughs> orchestral stuff, or that I'm either yeah. that or too lazy to work on it or do it. <laughs> um, I do a lot of stuff with my own analog instruments, bass, guitar, drums, with the friends, and riff raff I keep around here. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I would like to introduce you to our friend from Los Angeles, Paul Olson. This piece is called Drafty. Okay.
Man, there's so much cool stuff going on in that one. A lot of cool chords, a lot of very interesting chords. I think that first chord might have even been a, a minor major seven chord. Yeah. I mean, he goes he goes from the seven to the octave, but then doesn't um, doesn't let up on the seven. Is that it doesn't sound like so. Can you get it? Right. That yeah. Thing right there. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so having both of them in the same chord creates you know like a, yeah. Yeah. Kind of, kind of that shimmery. Or actually, that's a minor, minor seven. Hold on. So, uh, so it kind of got that yeah, shimmery kind of sound. Of the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, in the melody. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also thought it was really cool his use of some of those kind of. I guess it was a Moog synth sound at mm -hmm. the very end. That yep. Wee! Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Everything kind of had its own little space. Every little instrument had a moment to do its cool thing. Yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'm just digging those chords. There's a lot of seven chords in there. Yeah, uh, a lot of different kinds of seven chords, you know. And yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of digging the sort of chromatic complexity, the the color of those chord progressions. Yeah. Oh, the chords are great. But he yeah. says this is before he even got into theory. We'll read about that in a second okay. here. Okay. But he says, um, let's see what you guys come up with. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but yeah, just um, a lot of cool little trinkets and shiny things and cookies and. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool tricks. There are a lot of cool. Te this man is a technician. This man knows how to manipulate sound. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Paul says, "So I've been listening to you guys since March and cannot overstate what a gift the podcast has been. I've been a musician since before I can remember, but I've always relied 100% on my ear. When I was a kid, I composed Legend of Zelda inspired MIDI jams on floppy disks. <laughs> laugh out loud. That's awesome. Yeah." <laughs> I, I want to hear those. Next time, send in some of your Legend of Zelda inspired MIDI jams. Hey, this is not going to be the last listener composition right. episode, so <laughs> there's always time to explore the Zelda the Zelda jams. He says, I graduated to recording post-rockish material on my home recording setup at 12 or 13. That's an early start. Mm -hmm. Although I neglected a formal education, I was super dedicated to music, exploring genres, instruments, and tonalities until my early 20s when I realized that A, money was a thing. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Right? Ugh, B, yeah. since I never studied music academically, um, my career options, short of receiving millions of Spotify plays and going on headline tours, unlikely. That's him saying that. Right. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> We're pretty slim, unless I got serious about it. Late last year, after turning 25, I decided to quit music and get in an adult job. Oh, no. Um, in tech, when a door opened up, I've never experienced a more miserable six months in my life. <laughs> oh. it happens to the best of us. Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> Needless to say, when I crash landed back at home and started this year, I found music again, or at least the drive to make it. I'd written everything in the past on feel relying on my ears, so I started piano lessons again. Began writing things down in Muse Score painstakingly. Yes, it is painstakingly. It can be done. painstaking. You because. get what you pay for. Muse Score is free. It is free. It is free. And shortly after, I found your podcast. It was around that time I absolutely fell in love with music theory, and I can't get enough. I'm slowly working through this Schoenberg's theory of harmony and savoring every page. Schoenberg's theory of harmony. Schoenberg's theory of harmony. Wow. It's academic reading, no doubt. Uh, such, no doubt. <laughs> he's such a badass dude, says he. <laughs> Do you agree that Schoenberg is a badass dude, Matt? I agree that, that Schoenberg is definitely a badass dude, and to, to be reading through Schoenberg without a formal musical education, even with a formal musical education, that, that, is, uh, that would be impressive. Uh, but, but, but without one is just, you know, I can, I can only imagine... Uh, uh, the challenge that is. So, so bravo for that. Paul seems to appreciate that there's no ego that he can detect in Schoenberg's writing. He finds uh, that inspiring. Schoenberg's writing can be described as, as strangely egoless. Mm -hmm. uh, Schoenberg as the guy, Schoenberg the man, uh, egoless uh, or, or lack of ego was not a problem people thought of him as having. Mm -hmm. um, but but you know when I look look back on you know composition with twelve tones and, and things like that, yeah, it, it's kind of it, it's kind of uh, it can be kind of strangely egoless. It's know? interesting. 
Except for the part at the very beginning where he said, "Yeah, God made the the uh, God made the world, and I make music, so I'm kind of like God, and then I make music." <laughs> you once you get past that first paragraph, there he opens with that, but everything else is a uh, yeah. Eagles. After that, he gets he gets he he gets pretty humble. That's, <laughs> that is awesome. So lastly, he says he um he turned down. Paul says, "I turned down my acceptance to UCLA's anthropology program." To study music full time oh, at wow. my community college. That how how bold this fall, and could not be happier about my decision. You know, John Lennon has this quote. He says, "They asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, mm. and I told them happy." Uh huh. They said I didn't understand the question. Uh huh. I told them they didn't understand my answer. Hey hey hey. <laughs> Nice. Uh, and, you know, that that's what that story sort of brought to my mind. You know, sometimes there's something to be said for being happy. Uh, I tell people this all the time. I'm a music professor, <laughs> and I'm not getting rich off of this. Mm-hmm. You know, I did not pull up to Jeremy's in a, in a Mercedes today or anything. Huh? Um, but what I do for a living has a lot of opportunity to be really fun. Yeah. And really, really, uh, really energizing. If you're a weird music nerd like myself, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, stand, I stand around talking about music all day. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, essentially, you know, if I was to do one of those things where I say, you know, uh, describe your job in one sentence, you know, so that's what it is. I stand around and talk about music. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, you know, there's, there's something to be said for being happy in life. I think, Sounds like and, and Paul following your bliss, you know. Sounds like Paul understood John's answer. <laughs> I think he did. Maybe he did. Yeah, maybe he did. <laughs> so, regarding the logistics of the piece itself and how it was put together, here's what Paul had to say. So I had just finished dialing in my home studio that had been out of commission for a while and was on a recording spree. Everything is analog. The synth is a Korg Mini Log Direct End. Oh, a Korg, huh? Yeah, when my first keyboard was a Korg, and I loved it. It was an X3, and that got me through college. They were very popular back then. Yes, they were. I had the other one. I had the Yamaha W7, which was its Yamaha counterpoint. Oh, yeah, those are cool, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So anyways, he says, uh, and I use all that for the weird sounds. But if I were to use software, it would be reason for sure. Mm. Um, That's kind of my go-to MIDI software. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good one. He says, I have no idea what's going on since I recorded it pre-theory knowledge, hmm. slash haven't ever analyzed it. <laughs> so it'd be very cool and surreal to hear you guys break it down. Well, we'll see if we can help him out with that a little. Yeah, let's we'll see what we can do. So with all that in mind, let's listen to this one more time. Okay. Paul Olson, Drafty. You hear this AM radio sound? Yeah. Basically what he did was he put a high pass filter on the master track. So all the instruments are being filtered through this, rolling off all this low end. Nice. But it must be automated because at some point it's gonna kick in. Mm -hmm. But this is the theme we're talking about. It's A minor to G. Mm -hmm. And then maybe a D minor, four. F6. Lots of, not, lots of nice, good seven, uh, six chords, right. seven chords. Yeah. Oh, here we are. Yeah. Look at that, man. Minor, major, seven chord. But how the music opened up with that bass. Yeah. I just love that effect. It's just a cool thing to do, you know? And you'll really hear that with some headphones or a good stereo system, car, home stereo system. Now, this is fun. <laughs> A lot of people try to avoid this, but I kind of like it. Fret noise, you know, at the right place in time. Fret noise. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a, t- yeah, there's a time for it. Yeah. There's a time for it. Good drums, man. Good beat. Very good beat. Uh, good back and forth in texture, right? From a very loud, very present, and then, and then stepping back. Yeah. yeah, and sort of stepping forward and back a little bit, you know. Yeah. Uh, very nice contrasting textures there. Let's talk about this cool little whistle effect. Yeah, I don't even know what that is. Yeah, well, a lot of these, we're trying to decide what's what all's going on here, you know? <laughs> yeah. Instrumentation-wise. 
and that's part of being a good sound craftsman. Yeah. Would this maybe be a B section? Maybe, I don't know. Yeah. New section. A little You're a little up. hung up on that. Yeah, yes, yeah, <laughs> totally. Totally. I'm not going to let that go. <laughs> Oh, baby. That's what I'm talking about, man. <laughs> How badass is that? Wow. Yeah. All these other crazy, trippy sounds going around. Yeah. I just imagine myself driving really, really late at night, like down an empty highway, like really late at night. Just right. Here, you know. Maybe after playing a show. Yeah. <laughs> about a mile left to get home. <laughs> Try and stay awake. Interesting way to get out of it. It's this little loop kind of. Yeah, it's like you're never really out of it. Yeah. Uh. Stay awake. Yeah, fascinating song. Fa some fascinating chords going on in there. Yeah. Um, it definitely has a a, a distinct mood. Mm hmm Yeah, the, the the mood isn't isn't something that just sort of happened uh, by accident or by coincidence, right? This was a mood that was intended. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the this the chords and and the the instruments and everything. You know, from the even from the high pass filter AM radio. Mm -hmm. Sound is, is is put in there to to affect the the mood that 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 he wants. So yeah, uh, good work, very yeah. good work. It's like these uh, kind of white noise wind effects, kind of whoosh, yeah, yeah, kind of coming in and out. Yep, it takes it takes a bit of knowledge to to, to craft that those kind of sounds. Yeah. and then that solo um, synth at the end. Yep, uh, takes a certain amount of craft to appreciate the articulations that that those things brought back right. in the day, the analog yeah. versions. You know, yeah, oh yeah, oh, and it yeah. sounds like he's got his finger on that, literally. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> uh, before we move on, I do want to share a cool tip that Paul shared with us. Okay. He says, please check out functional ear please check out the functional ear trainer app. Functional it, ear trainer app. Yep. He says it's a free app that helped me so much with my interval recognition and solfege. A friend of mine named Austin at the school recommended it, and I think that all of your listeners should know about it. I will check that out. Uh, like you guys, the developer accepts and and deserves donations, but doesn't really require any payment. Right. Uh, so a shout out to Austin for bringing that to Paul, who's brought it to us. Right. Who and we are bringing it to the rest of our community. And I downloaded the app and I messed around with it, and it's actually really cool. It's oh, a good. It's a method. I'm not. It's it's a new kind of a new method. Oh really? Yeah. He'll play um like he'll play a one four five one progression. Yeah. And then play just one note. Uh huh. It'd be at the root. Anything in the major scale, at yeah, this yeah, point. yeah. And you pick it and you get it. Oh wow, so. yeah, that can really help. Sort of uh, recognizing notes in context, mm -hmm. single notes in context, which can really uh, help your relative pitch. Yeah, I get that. So I got, I got, I aced the first two lessons, and then the third lesson, I got. I do this thing where I'm. It's kind of stupid, but I do it anyways. I, I think probably a lot of people do. Maybe let uh. us know. Let me know. But if I get like into the third lesson and I get one wrong, I'm like, no, that's impossible. That could not have happened. <laughs> I rewind it and I start the whole damn thing over again. What could I have possibly missed? I have yeah. to get an a hundred. I have to get a perfect score. Yeah. Oh yeah. You're preaching to the choir, man. <laughs> then at some point, I just abandon it and put it down. I'm like, okay, well, I wasn't gonna get a perfect score. So you know, yeah. I get bored. <laughs> But yes, we'll check that out, and um, y'all, you guys should check it out too. It is a cool app. It's great Absolutely. for Absolutely. Okay. Great job, Paul. Thanks again for writing in. Thanks for sharing your music. Now let us move on, shall we? Let's move on. Do I say that too much? Eh. Okay. Now, next up, we have Seth Hammonds from Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, Seth is actually a new Patreon patron. Well, thank you so much. And I'll go ahead and say that it's kind of funny, but all of these composers. Our Patreon patrons, and we did not plan to, We did not plan it that way. No, no, it's not like I just picked cherry picked the Patreon people. No, the, no, 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 no. The only people that have been writing in for this episode that we got music from are 
still, it, which, just, it, just, it just worked out that way. It probably goes to show how dedicated they are to music and uh, the study and knowledge thereof. Maybe so, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe so. But anyway, we have Seth Hammond's composition. Yes. I'm looking at, I have Seth's score in front of me. Uh-huh. I'm thinking Seth probably used... Sibelius? <laughs> the notes look like the notes just sort of look like that fatness that Sibelius has, which I like because it's easier to read. Yeah, yeah. That, well, that's why they do it that way. It's because it's easier to read. Uh huh. Um, and maybe finale. It could be finale. Uh huh. Could also be finale. Anyway. Well, this was another piece where the first time I heard it, I kind of had to ask myself, you know, again, what what's what's really going on? What's here? really going you know on I mean? here? Let's see if we yeah, let's see if we can determine what's really going on. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Labyrinth by Seth Hammonds. Okay, man. Uh, what do you think about that? You don't know anything about the backstory at this point. I don't know anything about the backstory. Yeah. Wow. So, if someone were to ask me, "Well, gee, what key do you think that's in?" You know, or what do you think those chords realized or implied are? Mm-hmm. You know, or is this a mode? I might be very inclined to say, to ask in return, mm. because you know, all, you know, professors never just give you an answer. They always ask another <laughs> question, right? I might be inclined to ask in return, does it have to be in a key? Oh. Do these have to be chords? Ah. Or are there better ways to describe what's going on in this music? Mm-hmm. You know, remember always that, that music theory is ultimately description, right? It's not a set of rules mm-hmm. so much as it is an attempt to describe what's going on in a piece of music. So as we're choosing what labels to apply to what music, you know, we have to always be cognizant of our ultimate goal, which is not to slap labels on music, mm-hmm. but to describe what's going on. Mm-hmm. I think if we try to say, well, this is an E minor or this is, you know, a, f- you know, five flat five sharp nine of, of two moving to a six, six, four, something, you know, the, the, this, the, the, we would d- discover really fast that we weren't saying anything super relevant, hmm. you know. So I, I start to wonder, you know, is this really just sort of a freely atonal piece? You know, um, uh, you know Paul, who is reading Schoenberg right now, uh, might well appreciate the fact that this is this is music that doesn't really conform to that. Uh-huh. This is a melody that is spun out of a group of notes associated with each other, mm-hmm. right? Um, so this is, we will get to this one day in a theory episode, but this this might be a, a great uh, candidate for a set theory analysis. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. It's something that I may think, you know, where we have, we just have notes that are, that belong together via their association in this piece of music. Okay, we'll dig this, man. Here's a little bit about this piece. Um, okay. He says, 
The basic idea is that the composition is a moving observer mm -hmm. that is walking through a labyrinth. Mm -hmm. And here's other emitters that are generating tones around the observer. Aha. Uh -huh. Depending on their relative movement, the tones shift in pitch just like the Doppler effect, okay? Okay, So okay. as these tones are getting further from you, they're dropping right. in pitch. Okay, okay, okay. Interesting, right? Yes. Each emitter generates its tone at a regular rhythmic interval and combine with the pitch shifting this creates four voices. Uh-huh. Add some dynamics and voila. <laughs> it's one of those things where the idea came to me in a flash and then took weeks to work out the details. That's the way every good piece of music right? happens. Yeah. The generating idea is not necessarily musical, but I think there are plenty of common practice ideas in there. The overtone series, mm -hmm. voices, mm -hmm. syncopation, etc. Mm -hmm. I would agree with him. And I would even argue that the generating idea is not musical simply because it's not a chord or, or something or in a, in a key. That doesn't make it not musical, right? He made it musical. He took it and made right. it musical, right? right? Yeah. Because yeah. no, something just a generate. Well, if something's a generating a tone, it is a tone. A tone is a tone. A tone is a tone. All sounds are musical to some degree. But it doesn't mean anything until you reference it to other tones, does it, musically? Or does it? E. Or is that too deep? I might need another beverage before we get into that. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, so let's let's continue. Okay. He, he says, uh, getting to a place that felt like music, like we're saying, and not just the noise took a lot of trial and error. The scoring ended up a bit weird due to the chromaticism and the way the notes are intended to overlap. And that yeah. might be that might be a um, muse score thing also, huh? Well, yeah, if he's using muse score, then yeah, he's doing a good job to get it as... as Clear as he has it, you know, music score can be a can be a pain. It wants to change your words and music. It wants yeah, to yeah. There, there are some things. There doing. are some things he could do score wise to make it a little more clear exactly what's going on. But he he didn't do bad. Mm -hmm. And you can check out the score on the website also. Mm -hmm. And just like you said, uh, interestingly, he says, "I'm not sure it really has a key." This is Matt. You never heard this before, right? I'm not. No, I never heard that before. But but yeah, I, I don't. I don't think he. I agree. I don't, uh, uh, Seth. I don't think you should try to uh, hammer this into a key at all. No, I no. You know. That's the first thing I'll do if I look at something. That's just me, you know. <laughs> he says maybe an E Phrygian vibe, beginning and then moving to D sharp major. Well, those last those last two chords. The are last D -sharp two major. chords are definitely a consonant sonority. Mm -hmm. Do they? Do they? For that reason, deserve to be imbued with the moniker tonic. Mm. Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. is a music aesthetics question. If this whole thing happened with just a bunch of chromaticism and chaos, and then the very last two chords is a five to one, <laughs> does that make it? I mean, that doesn't make it automatically in the key of whatever that chord that it resolved to, obviously. Uh, I'm looking at it. You know, this D sharp goes all the way into the middle of the piece here. Yeah. So you know, I don't see the five to make D sharp tonic. If anything, it's just a. a what we we might call a pedal tone, right? Uh, right. A a pitch uh, interval class seven uh, pedal tone. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, set theory way of saying perfect fifth. Uh, but so you can actually find more about this piece in this process of putting together on his website, which I will link on the on the page mm -hmm, on the site. Mm -hmm. And that is sethhammonds dot com with two m's. Okay, so let's go ahead and listen to it one more okay, time. One more time with our yapping. With our yapping. However helpful that is. <laughs> here we go. This is the observer. Mm -hmm. This one melody here. Yep. Second voice comes in. Yeah. This is one of those emitting tones, emitting tones. Third voice. More tones. More tones. This is very Schoenbergian. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I would have, if I'd, if I'd have been made to guess, I would have guessed it was Seth that had been reading Schoenberg's <laughs> right. theories. The observer remains, remains pretty constant. Yeah. The observer de eventually does kind of move into a D sharp place, you know. Uh, could maybe think of that as mo moving through the maze. Yeah, maybe. You know, uh, 
if you're going from E, if, if he was based in E Phrygian and he moved to D sharp, that would be moving down. Yeah. Further away in distance. Yeah, but is he even really based in E Phrygian or is that just D? Yeah, just I don't you know. Un, unspecified D. You know. I'm not sure. Is it the first note that is the root of that scale? Okay, right here. We have a little bit of diatonicism yeah. introduced into the piece. But it's at the very end of the piece. Yeah. Right when I assume maybe they got out of the lab, <laughs> they found the end of the labyrinth. <laughs> oh, this is this we is so assume. fascinating. So again, I feel like I'm going to start talking about this a lot uh, to you know, for 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 better or worse. But you know, you have. <laughs> You have the representational level of composition, right? This means that. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, lowest voice in the left hand is the person walking through the maze. Mm -hmm. This represents that. Yeah. yeah. Level one musical comp composition. Uh, and, and then the, the other voices represent the sonic emitters, you know, and, and so, their Doppler effects sort of going off and guiding him through... So there's there's that level one composition, and then uh, and then there is the emotional expression level, mm -hmm. right? In which we have an an emotional reaction to the way those notes are combining. Mm -hmm. You know, a sense of confusion and unease mm -hmm. at uh, what is going on. Uh, around us as we try to move through this maze, mm -hmm. you know, and then always the hardest level to get at the, the metaphorical maze, the the working out of the maze, or the the making significant the emotional experience by analogizing it, by making by by making a metaphor of a maze to begin with, mm -hmm. you know, that, that is speaking to and making significant human experience, mm. you know. Um, so, so, uh, yeah, to be able to compose effectively on all three of those levels is what makes you a good composer. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, I think anybody can write, you know, uh, throw some notes together and say, oh, well, this is the whatever, you know, this is a bird flying by, this is the wind rustling in the trees, blah, 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 look, you know, and uh, that's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's certainly not difficult to put together a bunch of chords and say, oh, listen to this, this is a sad song. Or this is a happy song, you know. Uh, people can people can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, that third level is maybe not not so easy. Most people, I don't think, realize it exists. Uh, but but a, a good composer can do all of those things at the same time, mm -hmm. right? Can 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 write on the representational, the allegorical. Can also write on the emotive while he's or she is representing. And 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 doing both of those at the same time creates sort of the metaphorical, the 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 unifying experience, the artistic experience that connects us as we listen and as we compose. Yeah, uh, very very good. Very much not in a key. Yeah. Okay. And and that is very much okay. Okay. Um, yeah. I if I were to sit down and analyze this uh, piece, uh, I would maybe talk about uh, the group of notes that are in the left hand. Which create a what a like a o one two five uh, o one two seven eight maybe looks like something like that uh, set class and then the uh, pitches in the right hand that create something else and and their interplay together you know mm. Mm. I would talk about the uh, importance of uh, the uh, half step as a unifying melodic factor. I would talk about the importance of the perfect fifth as a unifying melodic factor. Mm. You know? um, and I would talk about those things. I wouldn't try to hammer it into chords or keys. That's uh, refreshing to hear, actually. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, we, caught, we often forget that theory is not a set of rules, like we say. Absolutely not. Composers make the music, and we try to describe it. Yes. That's, that's what theorists do. Yes. Uh, so, 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 yeah, it's... Uh, the last thing theory ought ever to do is say, well, you can't do this, or you can't write this music. Mm -hmm. um, that is not theory's, a theorist's job. And if a theorist is doing that, he or she needs to be reminded of what their job <laughs> is. <laughs> okay, so we got one more we're going to listen to here. Okay. 
And uh, Chris Waite mm -hmm. from Beachport, South Australia, has been with us for a long time, actually. He's been with us on Patreon for a while. Excellent. And we've had a little correspondence back and forth. And uh, really good guy. He's a doctor. Mm -hmm. Not of music. No, not the high-paid high kind. High-paid kind. Um, but this is a piece he wrote. If I can call it, call it a piece, it's, it's quite magnificent. It's quite, quite an opus, really. Quite, a, quite an epic piece. Quite an epic yeah. piece, yeah. Um, called That's Where the Light Enters You. I'm dying to know. So Jeremy has not told me any of the backstories of any of these compositions. Uh -huh. I'm dying to know the backstory of this one. This That's is... Where the Light Enters You is a very compelling title for a piece of music. All right, so let's give it a listen. Uh, see what you got, Chris. Turn your head. Let your eyes get used to light. Keep looking at the world. That's where light enters you. Not for a moment are you really yourself.
epic. Epic, right? Epic. Yeah. Wow. Um, first of all, his orchestration uh, is very close to like my typical orchestration. As mm-hmm. I'm looking through the instruments he chose, uh-huh. I mean, yeah, these are all instruments I typically choose for orchestra pieces. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if that's a bad thing or a good thing, but, <laughs> but I think I certainly am uh, endeared to this piece right away just because he has, yeah, he has the triangle and the tam-tams and the suspended and cl- These are all <laughs> instruments that find their way into my orchestra pieces a lot. Like our friend Alex O'Hagan, he had who, a very yeah, good score. Yeah, who, who has uh, similar constructions. I can tell from his orchestration and from how he's... Uh, labeled his orchestration that he knows something about this. Let me tell you a little bit about it, shall I? Yes. Now, Chris is actually, like I said, a medical doctor. Uh Uh-huh. But um, he recently got his B.A. in music. Ah, there we go. (laughs) In fact, I think we we congratulated him not too long ago about that. Um, I believe we may have. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is coming back to me now. Totally. It's been a minute. He says, this piece was a part of a home recording and production subject I took. Uh Uh-huh. So again, this is a course, right? Right. Now, he says, I put together photographs captured of the Southern Lights, mm. the Aurora Australis. Australis. Yeah, okay. Which is visible from Beachport. Did you know that there were Southern Lights? I didn't. Aurora Borealis is what we all know as the, uh, is the Northern Lights. Northern yeah, Lights, up in Canada, yeah, and stuff. In but Alaska, and, yeah. Aurora Australis. Australis. Wow. However you would say that. Australis. You can see that from South Australia across the Southern Ocean sometimes. So he's he's superimposing these pictures um, mm-hmm. with this electronic and acoustic music that he composed and recorded at home. I see. And then he out, was able to have it, an orchestra play along with it live, and he sent a really cool picture of it, this yeah. orchestra playing his piece with a big big screen, yeah. basically of all these shots of the Southern Lights and different cosmic um, pictures. You know, Sounds great, yeah. It's quite fantastic. Um, let's see here. Oh, and I don't know if I clarified this earlier, but this is all Chris's performance. This is... A few piano tracks of his layered in with some MIDI and some synth sequencing. Oh. And considering that, I thought it was pretty well executed. Right? Yeah. All right. I guess we could just go ahead and listen to it again and uh, and talk a little bit about it, shall we? I want to, yeah. This was another one where I started talking about sections. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, and uh, Chris is making that uh, easier for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. We'll see. We'll see. Shall we? Yes. Okay. Again, Chris, wait. That's where the light enters you. Okay. Right off. Turn your head. Let your eyes get used to light. Keep looking at the world. This is vocoder, a vocoder effect. It is, yeah. So this is the electronic aspect of the electronic music. Compo- the electronic acoustic composition. That is a, uh, that's Chris himself mm. saying that with mm. the vocoder effect. Yeah. Drawing his inspiration from Rumi, the poet. Some strings and, uh, I guess that piano? Yeah. This is kind of the main theme. The, the same melody in a six or something like that, maybe? It's, it's the same melody, uh, but he has he has realized a bass underneath it. Mm. Whereas before he had sort of pedal tone basses, right? Exactly. section you're so caught up on that <laughs> it's, it remains in the same key you know, so. that's true great little percussion little yeah subtle things like that percussion in music like this is often decorative more than more than uh, anchoring the rhythm Hear that how that little thing sounds almost like it's on an echo? Yeah. That's a fun, cool effect. Wow. Yeah. Nice. A 
descending movement. A lot of wonder in here. Mm -hmm. It's like awe. Awe and wonder. Very nice melody, very pleasant melody. Yeah. It's just sort of, uh... Yeah, that, that is, is sort of, um, transient, too. The melody is sort of meditative, too. Yeah. In a different way. You can barely hear this little synth. Going on. Yeah, yeah. Down, down. Now he kind of alters the rhythms a bit on this theme. Yeah. Yeah, there are ways to keep uh, the same melody going and keep it fresh, and one of the one of the ways is to subtly alter things. Yeah. Right. Some of our other composers have, have uh, caught on to that too. Nicely done, Chris. Nice chimes. I love the chimes. And we have created a dramatic moment here by bringing all the instruments together. Yeah. It's the, it's the most subtle. It's the most subtle climax ever. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it can still be called sort of a climactic moment because they've come together for the first time. Yeah. There's more motion here. There's mm -hmm. more depth. Yeah. Almost a little romantic. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, it's almost we, we so we moved away from just sort of gazing, you know, uh, gazing in trance-like way at, at these lights, and moved more towards an emotional reaction. Yeah. Well, again, there is the the, the allegorical, and there's the motive. Yeah. You know, and then there's the four. Right. little trail off too beautiful yeah again great job chris great job we uh really love all of this music so much yeah yeah and and um i felt that way after the first time we did these listener compositions you know i'm legitimately impressed by all of you yeah i think all of you are legitimately impressed by all of you too because <laughs> we got a lot of really good reviews on that first listener composition episode so good, it's definitely going to be a thing we do more often yes we absolutely want to every 20 episodes or so we're thinking uh, every 10 episodes every 10 episodes hey there you go if we can do it yeah <laughs> if we can do it we, the, the music keeps coming so we'll keep on doing it you know absolutely oh i can't get out of here without giving a shout out on behalf of chris Waite, dr chris Waite. <laughs> he wants to thank his professor at the University of Southern Queensland, Dr. Rod McNeil. Oh, very nice. He spent hours encouraging him to orchestrate better and bring these ideas to life. Very nice. Very nice. So, yeah. Love hearing all these professors getting love. Yeah, don't you? <laughs> so, wow. Um, what else can be said about this episode? I mean, I'm just impressed, man, because there's so much creativity and so much talent among our listeners, and uh, we're just... Uh, we're so, so happy you guys are sharing it with us. So much, you know. I, I'm glad that part of what we're doing on this podcast is sort of providing a a, a a little bit of an outlet, anyway, to sort of to sort of get your music into the ears of some other uh, music lovers. You know, with you know, with the transcribing a song and with the listener compositions and things. I would I would like to find uh, keep doing this, and I'm sure we will. Because yeah, like I keep saying it, but it, it's the truth. I am legitimately. I'm legitimately impressed. I would have been proud to call any of these compositions my compositions. Hey. So, you know, good job, everyone. Okay, so before we get out of here, I want to say um, another time I want to say thank you to our composers, Cody M. Gibson, Ray Parker, Seth Hammonds, Paul Olson, Chris Waite, Alex O'Hagan, and, of course, our good friend Scott Jackson, who we're going to be closing out this episode with the... With the uh, Outro music. Yes. Um, again, like I said, Scott opened this up with his first song, A Chance to Fly. 
And since we didn't get to yap over it, maybe that just wasn't fair. <laughs> maybe we got to show him a little bit more love. We have to yap over this. <laughs> oh, no, we won't be yapping over this because he's singing. Oh, yeah. So we're going to come out well, with that's why enough. we didn't yap over it in the first place. Exactly. But um, um, since he was kind enough to send us as, as much as he did, we'll go ahead and close out with uh, his original piece called Rivers. Okay. And this is a pretty cool piece. Um, I was attracted to it because, you know, I guess it's just a pleasant song. You know, I like the lyrics. Um I like the finger picking, uh, a good droning, the droning kind of sound that a finger pick guitar delivers, I find to be relaxing. Equally relaxing is this kind of soft droning sound, this tone that kind of carries throughout the piece. And then it ends with birds. I like birds, and um, I like it. Matt, you enjoyed it too. You, you I heard did. <laughs> um, and a cool thing about this piece is uh, it's a good example of a one six two five turnaround. See so if you hear that one six two five. Very nice. Yeah, circle of fifths progression. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. He's in the key of C major, then he goes to a four uh, F major, but mm. then that F major drops to an F minor mm -hmm. right before the turnaround. So that's cool too. Interesting. Yep. Theory wise, that's some pretty cool stuff. Yeah. But just music wise, I hope you enjoy his voice and as I have and his music, and look him up too at the. Uh, sjacksonmusic.com Very nice. Thanks again for listening. Better to wait for your time.